Right. Okay, so um, what to say to you in 20 minutes on this vast topic? And uh, you'll forgive me, I hope, that it will be very non-specific. But what I hope I'm going to do is actually just show you a little bit about where we think the big issues are and where you may well be able to help us. So, big title, how do we know if our climate is changing and why? Well, anybody who's followed the IPCC will know that the fifth assessment report was pretty categorical about, uh, yes, our climate is changing. And why do we think it's changing? Because we can detect from observations a whole range of changes, not just in uh, surface temperature, but in all sorts of other aspects of the climate system. Um, but it's never as simple as that. So um, if we go to what is often the iconic figure, the global mean surface temperature, and this is presented to you in a slightly different way in that um, we've... Um, have I got a pointer? I'm not sure. Yes, I have. In here that we've categorised, we've ranked the temperatures rather than just plotted them in time. And one can see that all the warmest years are in this red um, colour, which is pretty well the last uh, two decades or so. And that uh, as you go back in time, and here's the full record going back over at least uh, the top 150 ranked temperatures. And what you see is a warming planet of about 0.8 degrees since uh, pre-industrial, something like that. But of course, what's been really interesting is that you can see that actually the warmest year was 1998 for quite a long time. And uh, there was a lot of debate was about what, why is the surface temperature not continuing to rise at the rate that we would expect from simple energy budget calculations in terms of the accumulation of heat because of increasing greenhouse gases. And through that period, we've continued to increase our emissions of carbon dioxide and the uh, accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere has continued apace and yet the surface temperature appears not to have warmed very much. So what's going on? Have we got our estimates of climate sensitivity completely wrong? Is in fact the planet uh, far less sensitive to the increase in greenhouse gases uh, than the climate modelling community have suggested so far from particularly the period uh, in the 19... 60s to 1990s what on earth going on and so we had the rise of what we call now call the lukewarmers who say actually the climate sensitivity is not as big as your climate models say and it's not going to be that bad is it so the big question for me really in all of this is uh, if we go to the this usual schematic of the uh, energy flows in the planet is to ask, well, where, does all the where, where has all the energy gone? We believe that the planet has continued to accumulate energy over the last 10, 15 years, but we're not seeing it in surface temperature. And uh, this is, I'm not going to go through this diagram in detail, and I know that you have a very nice uh, very nice plans at NPL for truce, which is really trying to get to grips at what goes on at the top of the atmosphere, which at, at the most fundamental level is what we want to know. But of course, as you get away from the top of the atmosphere, things get vastly more complicated. And we don't live up here, we live down here. And so all sorts of other things go on that determine the global uh, surface balance and therefore the global surface temperature. And this is from Trenberth, now quite an old figure, but there is an imbalance of just under one watt per metre squared at the bottom of the atmosphere, at the surface, and that's a residual of a whole lot of rather big fluxes here that, again, we don't know uh, with any great accuracy. And this is one of the fundamental problems for us, that from space we could, I think, feasibly have a go at the top of atmosphere. At the surface, we're really struggling. And then... This is the bit actually we're really interested in, the bit that doesn't balance. And where does that go? Well, 90% of it goes into the oceans. And so when we looked at what we now call the pause in global warming, we asked the questions, well, where has more of this heat got sequestered away in the, into the oceans? Or indeed, is in fact the... Uh, our estimate of what we think 
the net balance at the top of the atmosphere not quite what we thought we thought thought it was through the pores and it probably looks like a bit of both to be honest we we think that there has been uh, of course we've had a solar minimum quite a deep solar minimum we've also probably had more of a residual volcanic ash than we thought we think there's probably more anthropogenic aerosol forcing than we thought and you can come up with lots of arm wavy and get the odd 0.1 watt per meter squared out of these things. And then we think quite a lot of it's gone into the ocean. The fact is that we still don't really know. And this bit that's gone into the ocean is really interesting. And uh, this is why we wonder about it, because this is the difference in sea surface temperature between the 1990s and the 2000s. And what you see is... Uh, this is zero here, is that there's quite a lot of regions of the oceans that have, be, uh, are, are, have become colder at the surface uh, through this last decade or so. And this pattern, if you're an oceanographer, you look at this pattern, you say, hmm, that looks like a real pattern. It looks like ocean dynamics coming into play. The thing that's so fascinating about the ocean is that it's not just heat that matters, it's the salinity as well, it's the density. So it is perfectly possible through more salty water to actually take heat down below the surface. And uh, what we think is probably going on is that these patterns certainly up in here and, and through here are reminiscent <coughs> of structures that we might associate with ocean Rossby wave structures, upwelling and downwelling associated with uh, ocean dynamics. Likewise, this looks like what we call a persistent La Nina pattern. Cold here in the east, very warm water uh, meteorologically in the warm pool West Pacific here, which has been really quite important for a lot of the extreme weather that's occurred in the last few years in this neck of the woods. And there's some really interesting stuff here going on in the Southern Ocean, which we know is a really important part of the world for formation of deep water. So it looks as though the ocean's up to something. But of course, measuring where heat goes in the ocean and remembering the thermal capacity of the ocean and the amount of energy we're talking about, we're talking about a massively challenging detection problem. And it's really, really challenging. And, uh, but we, this pattern, we call it the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Pattern, we think that that has had quite an influence of how much heat is sequestered below the surface. So when we start talking about climate sensitivity as a relationship between surface temperature and net energy accumulation by the planet, this gets very complicated when you try and uh, constrain it through observations because the, the surface temperature is influenced by the dynamics as much as it's influenced by the thermodynamics. So this is a very interesting topic. We haven't resolved it. Uh, it is now very interesting. You'll see that at the top here, this is our latest estimate of the global mean surface temperature this year. It's about a tenth of a degree. This is massive, a tenth of a degree warmer than this time last year. And what, so um, what's going on? Well, look at the pattern of the sea surface temperature anomalies this year. And you can't have missed the fact that we have an El Nino developing very strongly now in the uh, tropical Pacific. But this pattern all up here is now the inverse of that pattern that I showed you earlier. In other words, is the Pacific decadal oscillation or this thing that is moving heat around the North Pacific changing sign? And how would we know if it was? And indeed, we talk about the heat being sequestered at depth and that it, it will re-emerge at some point. But what's the process? How does heat re-emerge? How does it come back up to the surface? These are all things that actually are absolutely critical for understanding how we interpret climate sensitivity and what we think the trajectory of global warming will be. And it may be, I mean, some of these things like the, whoops, sorry, Seem to have, uh, some of these things, like the warming of the Indian Ocean, has indeed been a very persistent signature over the last few decades. And it's changing subtly, perhaps the strength of the monsoon winds. And what we don't know is that as the 
the oceans accumulate heat gradually over time, whether their behaviour will change quite fundamentally. Um, and, and that through dynamic adjustment, the climate sensitivity also might be a function of how climate change evolves. So we have to sort of not be too bound by this, this number that we seem to want to seek, which is the, the climate sensitivity or the transient climate response to a doubling of CO2. It's a useful framework to shape questions, but it's not for, for many of us the ultimate uh, goal of what we're trying to do. So the point is here that understanding where all the heat goes means, I think, seeing below the surface in some way or other. And we can do that in lots of ways. And these are uh, instrumented sections that we have. Um, and the rapid array was part of that to see if we can see changes in the deep ocean circulation and, and changes in how heat is being moved, particularly in our neck of the woods, the North Atlantic, and the, and the state of the thermohaline circulation. But of course, there are other ways of doing this, and this is an interesting paper that came out last year, and I put this up just because it shows what you can do from measurements. And this is looking at now something much, um, a bulk measurement of, well, sea level rise has to be one measure of where the energy is going in the oceans. And this is uh, here, an example through the 2000s, so the bit we're interested in, the pause, this is the total sea level rise from satellite altimetry. We can also get an idea of the mass of the ocean from GRACE. So this is using other measurements that are up there, not necessarily for this problem. And uh, that sort of capturing, in a sense, the uh, increase in the water volume of the ocean from changes from ice melt, glacier melt, um, and by maybe even changes in the hydrological cycle. And then you can take the residual of those, and that gives you essentially the thermal expansion. And you can also use the Argo floats, the straight temperatures from the Argo floats, admittedly at this stage in the record quite sparse, and really they're only looking at the top kilometre or so, and you find that actually they do look quite similar. And so you get this sense that actually, despite the fact that the global mean temperatures at the surface have not changed, the oceans have continued to accumulate heat and sea level rise has continued. But the point is, um, the, is that you can deduce what the energy balance would have been, was in this period, and it comes out at this sort of number, but look at the plus or minus. So this is where this is the state of the art we're in. So we are really struggling, actually, with this problem of being able to really nail where do we think the heat goes. The other thing about uh, this diagram, of course, is where does all the water go? Because the, the, what really balances everything, either at the surface or at the top of the atmosphere, is what's going on in here with the water cycle. Because water vapour is the dominant greenhouse gas, so of course it determines that number. Water vapour in its solid form becomes clouds, and that determines that number. It also determines these numbers here. And if you're at the surface, how do you balance the radiation? Well, you balance it predominantly through evaporation. So phase changes of water are absolutely an integral part of how the Earth's energy balance is realised. And um, we, we, when we look at things like climate sensitivity, a lot of it's still about cloud feedbacks. And to some extent, it's still about water vapour feedback, something that ought to be quite tractable, particularly in the upper troposphere, because we have very great difficulty measuring it accurately. Um, and so, and, and also, if you do the, ray, the energy balance just for the atmosphere, then you find that actually the atmosphere as a whole cools radiatively, and the, it's, that cooling is balanced by uh, the release of latent heat through condensation. And so, the precipitation rate for the planet is essentially determined as a balance between atmospheric radiative cooling and latent heat release through condensation. So the requirement that that balance must exist 
uh, is a constraint on what will happen to the hydrological cycle under global warming. So a lot of people quote Klaus's clapper on moist thermodynamics and say that it has to be 6% um, per degree, something like that. Actually, it's not. It's about half of that because it has to actually be, whoops, keep pressing it. It has to be this, the balance in the atmosphere in entirety. may not be locally, but globally, that's what it has to be. So here we are. So we accept that the global water cycle is absolutely fundamental to the climate system. And it's tricky because we are able to support, with the temperature of the planet, water in its three phases. And it's the phase changes of water that effectively move heat around the world. And uh, this is probably what makes modelling the troposphere perhaps the most challenging bit of all of it because we have to be able to handle those phase changes of water and the fact that you evaporate water in one part of the world and condense it somewhere else completely different. So this is uh, really what we're up against and even something as fundamental as what is the global precipitation rate is, non is still not constrained by observations and so Graham sitting here played a Graham Stevens who you probably taught yesterday, did you, Graham? No, but we've made really fantastic advances in this whole area by putting active sensors in space. This is really transforming what we can do and understand about clouds, where they form at height in the troposphere, whether they're ice, water, at what point do they start to precipitate, all those things. And all the, of course, clouds are, um, I keep pressing the wrong buttons here, very irritating. Um, <coughs> clouds are very small scale structures, so they're much more difficult, clouds and precipitation, much more difficult than temperature. And so this is where, for many of us, understanding, being able to simulate and know what's happening to the water cycle is absolutely critical. Um, of course, to close the water cycle, you need to know where it goes when it hits the, the surface. And we again have very poor understanding of the terrestrial, of terrestrial hydrology. Very difficult to measure soil, water, soil moisture. We can, through again through GRACE, get an understanding of, on the large scale, how much water is moving from the land to the ocean, how much water is in the aquifers, how much water we're extracting from groundwater and using and taking it out into other parts of the system. But I think for us, many of, for many of us, knowing even what the soil moisture is, is something that is vitally important because it's a strong constraint on the thermal energy, budget, on the energy budget at the surface. How, how wet the surface is determines ultimately what the temperature is. So, that's the sort of, for me, the two big problems. Where does all the energy go and where does all the water go? Where does all the heat go and where does all the water go? And of course we can use models, and I'm not going to say anything much about models today, except that I personally think that the development of climate and now Earth system models is one of the great scientific achievements of the last few decades and probably undervalued for what they do because through just taking Newtonian uh, the equations of motion, thermodynamics, radiative transfer, um, and uh, putting all that together, we can actually simulate the richness of the Earth's climate system from El Ninos and monsoons and thermohaline circulations, and even the global mean temperature of the planet and a net radiation budget at the top of the planet that's pretty close to zero. None of those things are given. And of course, the constraints that many of these, most of these models now run under, because they're fully coupled atmosphere ocean models, uh, are very few. And they are basically how much energy comes from the sun. And we know that that's really quite critical. And actually, we also need to know on what parts of the spectrum that energy is, it comes from. Um, we also, of course, the rotation rate of the planet is the big determinant of, of a lot of the dynamics of the planet. And that's about it. 
if one's brutally honest, because we don't even give the planet uh, the water vapour concentration in the atmosphere. That is generated through the moist processes. That's our dominant greenhouse gas, and that's ultimately what gives us the surface temperature of the planet. In the past, we would have imposed other greenhouse gas concentrations, but now we only give the emissions and allow the chemistry and all the other processes to determine what the concentration of greenhouse gases will be in the atmosphere. So these are, these are the only fundamental constraints, and I think a lot of people think that we've actually constrained these models to give the answer we want. These models have so many degrees of freedom, they will not give you the answer you want. They will have their own emergent properties, and I still think it's very remarkable that uh, here we are being able to predict an El Nino this coming winter and so on and so forth. But the point is that in all of this, it all has to be underpinned by observations at the end of the day. Otherwise, these models could be fairyland as far as I'm concerned. So observations not only underpin the model formulation, because there are still lots of things that we have to understand that work at the unresolved scale in the model, but they also are essential for evaluating model performance. And this is increasingly important that we evaluate models not just in their mean properties, but the processes and feedbacks and interactions that are going on in our models. And one of the great challenges we have is how do we go from, and you probably heard quite a bit about this yesterday, what effectively are measurements of some part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the radiances um, and things, to what the model is actually putting out. So how do we make sure we, have, we compare apples and apples? And over my career, I've struggled with this because I'm often looking at apples and pears and not really sure whether I'm seeing the right differences. But now we're actually able, through these models, to simulate uh, what the satellite is observing. So we can actually compare radiances and radiances, if you like. And this is becoming a really powerful technique for actually saying, is, are the structures of the clouds in our models what the, the active sensors that are in space on, on uh, CloudSat, for example, do they look the same? And then we see quite big differences, and that allows us to go into the model physics, into how we, but the cloud microphysics in particular, and uh, maybe do some field experiments with, an, with our aircraft to, to look at what's actually happening around and in clouds and, and make improvements to the model. So this is still, for us, a really, really important part of things. How do we go? from what the satellite measures to what the model has to use as its variables. And, uh, of course, models are absolutely at the bedrock of being able to say, yes, climate is changing, but actually it's all to do with us. So this is the attribution step, and it relies on using climate models to do the what-if experiment of saying, what if we hadn't emitted all those greenhouse gases? What would the Earth do? And uh, this is a nice example now of where we're going, not just looking at global mean surface temperature. Um, and the reason we struggle with that is because if, if there are big modes of decadal variability that are affecting that, then it's a, in the, what we call an initialized problem, that you have to have your model starting at the right phase of that decadal variability to be able to track observations. But here we're looking at something much more local, which is, this is the heat wave in Europe in 2003. So we're looking at the temperature just in this box here. And this is what it, how it would be if we had a, a model with no greenhouse gases in, control experiment. This is the global warming uh, simulation with observed uh, emissions through here. And then I think this is probably one of the high emission scenarios up here. And here are the observations. And what you find now is that certainly since uh, the end of the last century, you cannot capture the observations within the envelope of what the world would have been without greenhouse gases. So that's the formal attribution. <coughs> 
What's also interesting is that here's 2003, but despite the pause in global mean, global mean surface temperature, other aspects at the more regional level have continued to warm. So if you took this metric as a measure of climate change, you would say, well, it's, it's ongoing. And actually, according to this, it's running at the high, high end of what the models think should be happening. So this is really important that we don't get too bound up in this global mean problem because for the real world and for us as individuals, this is the sort of thing we should be concerned about. And uh, we can see now that actually 2003 would be a pretty normal summer by the middle of, the, of this century. And well, I don't like to think what it might be at the end of the century, but these are things that we uh, need to look at. And of course, still the question is, how reliable are these models, even for a fairly large region like that? Mm. So to conclude, well, for me, the two big questions that I think NPL surely has something to say about, where does all the heat go and where does all the water go? Mm. And and of course, I think what we really, really understanding now that this is not a simple energy budget problem anymore. This is a full four-dimensional climate change dynamic, a dynamical problem. It's all about how the heat moves around the system and how the water moves around the system. And so we've got to fuse the thermodynamics and the dynamics in the next few years. And I think that if we're going to really understand what all this means and how reliable our projections for the future are, it is going to be a fusion of theory, observations and models. One thing on its own won't do it. We have to work together on, on these sorts of things. Um, and I think it has to be a fusion of research and the what I call operational monitoring observing systems. And I think what I like about truths is that actually it's an anchor uh, for a lot of things that might fall into to some of the operational systems that are there for another purpose and therefore not necessarily as accurate as, as we might like for the climate problem. But fundamentally, what we need is, however good the models are, we have to be able to prove that they're reliable. And we have to be able to, constrain is the wrong word, we have to be able to evaluate them and to be sure that the, the range of possible outcomes that they come up with are physically plausible from the observations. And that does mean more accurate and I think more complete measurements of the climate system. And so I do think that uh, the development of new instruments and new techniques and clever use of existing measurements, as I showed for that ocean heat uptake, is going to be a really, really important part of how we decide what we're going to do about climate change and where we think we're heading in the next few decades and the century and so on. So thank you very much. And I probably ran over time.